Hello everyone it is uh, my absolute pleasure and honor to uh, the open up uh, someone very close to us uh, uh, in, in a, on a sort of a heart to heart chat uh, this is uh, professor rad shakir you all are well aware of him he was our boss uh, or he was our president uh, not so long ago uh, and uh, the i had the good fortune of associating with him for well over a decade now rad a very good morning to you it is evening for me uh, on this side good of the morning. town good morning how 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 are you getting on i am fine thank you i am very very well thank you uh, today our chat is going to be a little bit different uh, the the on behalf of uh, world federation neurology world brain day team social media team and youtube channel uh, i have the luxury of uh, opening up your heart uh, so i'm going to ask uh, some close up questions for you everybody knows who you are but my first question to you is tell us uh, how rad shakir was made uh, take us through the journey uh, of your lifetime from your high school days uh, to the university to the president of world federation neurology how did this happen this uh, first thank you for uh, this conversation and inviting me i am delighted and very happy to talk to you and your whoever is going to view this interview um you're asking me for a very very long story and um i i'll try to summarize it is that my interest in neurology started very early but before that i as you know i am from baghdad i was born in baghdad finished my medical school in baghdad university and one of the professors who passed away in the 80s Professor Hamdi was an elegant tall man who did his neurology in Germany and he taught us neurology and I was fascinated by neurology as a medical student and I was very very lucky that I had his support and uh, I, when I qualified in, from the medical school that was 1971 a long long time ago before you were born and I started um my residency in iraq and then i got into neurology back in iraq under professor hamdi after that in 1975 there was a lot of upheavals in that country since then and we all know where the country ended up now so uh, i left in 1975 and went to scotland mm -hmm. um and i was very uh, lucky to get a position junior doctor registrar at the institute of neurological sciences in glasgow and the the most famous man there was ian simpson those of you who don't know professor simpson he was the editor of neurology neurosurgery and psychiatry for 10 years and he was the first man who said myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease in a paper published in the scottish medical journal in 1960 so my work with him uh, was on uh, training and also got interested more and more in neurology and i did in addition to my training and got the membership my an msc in epilepsy and uh, i concentrated on immunological changes as a result of anti epilepsy medication especially iga and my thesis was on IGA in epilepsy and the immunological deficiencies caused by anti-epilepsy drugs. And I worked in an epilepsy center that used to be called Epilepsy Colonies for people with chronic epilepsy in a small town outside Glasgow called Bridge of Weir. And I did lumbar punctures on people with epilepsy as a part of a research project. Anyway, that's a long story. and it's, i finished uh, uh, in the right like rad rad i'll stop you there it's it's very interesting and fascinating that you mentioned this so it just uh, shows mm. uh, how visionary you and your supervisors were at that time you are well aware that uh, it's now coming full circle and uh, there's a group uh, that uh, who is uh, heavily advocating the immune inflammatory aspect of epilepsy as we speak now yeah. and the second thing is uh, when ian simpson was uh, talking about myasthenia gravis as a uh, autoimmune disease uh, there was no school of thought that neuromuscular junction was having receptors uh, even at that time 
so that was uh, the the so the, you must have the good fortune of uh, exceptionally high quality mentors uh, and very visionary thinkers uh, behind you at that time that is true and that's why i he passed away and his greatest uh, well second hobby other than neurology is he was playing the fiddle and he was a member of the scottish chamber orchestra and then when he died, Simpson, he, in the late 80s, he gave me all his slides, every slide he has made in his life. And uh, he gave that to me because he was one of these rare people who, at the age of 65, decided he's retiring. And the following day had nothing to do with neurology, not like you and me. Mm -hmm. His passion was elsewhere as well as neurology. So that mm -hmm. is important, I think, to have some other aspect mm -hmm. to your life other than neurology, which people vary. Hmm. So the 80s came and, and the early 80s, just to continue with my journey, hmm. I decided, well, maybe the time has come for me to go back to Iraq because mm -hmm. there were very few neurologists there. Uh, but at that time, I was going to Iraq and I went through Kuwait, which is a country south of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And that was in the summer of 1980. And I think people who know history of the area know what happened. Uh, the first Iraq-Iran war started in August, end of August, 1980. Mm -hmm. So here I was going back to a country which has just started war. So I stayed in Kuwait mm -hmm. and they, were, they had a new medical school. So I was appointed initially as an assistant professor, then associate professor in the new medical school where they had no, uh, no staff. Mm -hmm. And I took over there, eventually becoming the uh, vice dean for academic affairs in the University of Kuwait Medical School to organize the education. Mm -hmm. So that was my interest in uh, medical education in all its aspects and specifically in neurological education. Mm -hmm. And the first World Congress of Neurology I attended was 1981. Mm -hmm. And that was in Kyoto mm -hmm. in Japan, where I presented a poster. Mm -hmm. So this was my first encounter with the World Federation. And uh, at that time, John Walton, the late Lord Walton, mm -hmm. uh, was president. And then I got interested and I got to know people. And I got interested in tropical neurology because I was working in a tropical zone of the world. Mm -hmm. And got to know the late Nusheer Wadia. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wadia has been a close, close friend and a mentor, and uh, I worked with him and he got me into the tropical neurology group, eventually became secretary of that group of the WFN in 1985. Mm -hmm. In the second WFN meeting I attended, which was in Hamburg in Germany. Mm -hmm. So this is where my journey with the WFN began. At the same time, I was waiting for that war to finish. Do mm -hmm. I go back to Iraq? Do I not go back to Iraq? And then uh, as you know, the war lasted eight years. Mm -hmm. And eight years in your life at that time, when you have a young family, when you have a, to sort out your career, I didn't know where to go, what to do. Mm -hmm. So then we decided to go back to England. In the interim, I was lucky enough to, ha to meet the late Charles Poser. You're talking mm. about World Brain Day MS. Mm. Mm. Poser is one of the leaders in the world, the late Charles Poser in multiple sclerosis. Mm. And his classification of MS in 1981 is still used today, although the mm. McDonald criteria came after that and other criteria, but mm -hmm. the Poser criteria. So I met Poser because he was interested in something else. He was interested in two things other than neurology. Mm -hmm. You allow me to speak about something? Absolutely, like yes, 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 go for it. He was interested in two things, collecting um, military medical insignia. Mm -hmm. uh, elaborated he more, what were they? Cabinets in his house mm -hmm. with military insignia, medical military insignia from nearly every army in the world. Mm -hmm. And he went everywhere to collect them, to mm -hmm. small antique markets, to military uh, officers of various countries. So he came to me when he met me in Hamburg and said, listen, you work in this country called Kuwait. I know nothing about it. Would you invite me to visit? Because I want their insignia. So I managed mm -hmm. to get him the military insignia and Charles came. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And then he invited me to go back to Boston. And I got into Harvard as a lecturer, visiting lecturer on a fellow mm -hmm. in the middle 86, 87. Mm -hmm. And I worked with him. He was at the Beth Israel Hospital, having moved from Vermont. And I worked at Mass General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And at Mass General, I met many people, including mm -hmm. the late Ray Adams, who was retired by then, but he still came, mm -hmm. Miller Fisher, mm -hmm. E.P. Richardson, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I met Keith Kiapa. I don't know if you know him. He's a neurophysiologist of the first order, and he was heading the neurophysiology department. Mm -hmm. And I met Alan Roper, whom we mm -hmm. saw recently. Mm -hmm. Alan was, I was fascinated by Alan because he was young. We were all young. But he was the first neurologist I know who was an intensivist, mm -hmm. neurology of intensive care. And that started at Massachusetts General Hospital. So this is how then I decided that I need to move from Kuwait after being dean for academic affairs. And I went back to the UK uh, when the second Gulf War started in 1990. And I was the dean of the medical school uh, and the invasion happened while I was in Kuwait with my wife and two children. So imagine you being of Iraqi origin and the Iraqis invade the country of Kuwait. So what is your position? What do you do? So that is a life story which I am writing up. And Brilliant. the army came and then, the, and then once you speak, as you know, in any language, once you speak two sentences with your accent, people know where you come from. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. So I had to I had to leave because I could not serve as dean of an occupation force. Mm -hmm. Although the occupation force came from Iraq, but we all had our opinions about what happened. So I managed to leave with four suitcases, two children, my wife, and we left. Mm -hmm. And that story is another completely different migration story where we couldn't get to the UK. I could, my son could, because he was born in the UK. I had permanent residency, but my wife and daughter couldn't. Mm -hmm. So we ended up in a country which accepted people like us, Portugal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that part of my life. No, I, I, this is all news to me. I'm, I'm fascinated with it. Keep going. So I, we left Iraq through Jordan, and from Jordan then came a ban on anybody who's going to United Nations ban. They would not allow anybody holding Iraqi passports to fly. Mm -hmm. I had wind of this a week before, and because we had residency in Portugal, and that's another long, long story how I got that. Mm -hmm. So we ended up as in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And in Lisbon, I went to meet the professor uh, in the university department. She was, I think her name was Silva. I will double check that. Mm -hmm. And I went to see her and I said, this is my CV. This is who I am. Are you interested? She said, yes, I'm interested, but you have to learn Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, if we, if we are going to stay in Portugal, that was before Portugal became an EU country, mm -hmm. when the European countries had freedoms mm -hmm. rather than being all controlled by one super power called the Euro EU, mm -hmm. that was before EU. So we, uh, I went into a Portuguese school and that was one of the most difficult things to do, much more difficult than urology. I bet. For me, learning Portuguese at that age. So we start to get our children to school and they had to learn Portuguese. And then I was applying to come back to the UK. And I How many years did you spend in Portugal at that time? I spent about eight months. Mm -hmm. But we had no funding to support ourselves. So I had some friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, I don't know if you, if you remember, I can send it to you, World Neurology in, 19, a, in 1991. Lord Walton wrote about me in the president's column in World Neurology. Right. How did right. this man who was the delegate from Kuwait, how did he end up in Portugal? And he intervened on behalf of my wife and daughter so that they can get a visa to go back to the United Kingdom. Right, right. So John Walton and the WFN, I 
owe them a huge debt of gratitude. And we ended up in an airplane and they wouldn't put us on the plane to go to England because of my wife's and daughter's passports. I had residency, but then we got a, uh, the stamp of a visa from the British embassy in Portugal. Mm -hmm. I tried the American embassy and all they wanted from me was to get information about what is Kuwait, who is the invading force, because by then Kuwait was not yet liberated from mm -hmm. the Iraqi occupation. Mm -hmm. So we landed up in the United Kingdom and uh, I met many people trying to find a job again. That was late 1990, early 1991. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to circulation and I got a first, my first job was between Middlesbrough, which is in the north of England and Newcastle mm -hmm. as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And after, and that was a fantastic part of our lives. And uh, during all that time, I was still working with the WFN through the Tropical Neurology Research Group as secretary and uh, with Noshia Wadia and eventually as chair of the Tropical Neurology Research Group. And eventually in 1996, we produced our first book mm -hmm. on uh, tropical neurology with Charlie Poser. Mm -hmm. So Poser uh, was um, a real, real internationalist. You know, mm -hmm. Poser is Belgian, mm -hmm. comes from Belgium. He speaks French, of course, and he speaks English, and he is a very, very open international person. Um, and his interest in MS is legendary. And uh, I wish I can get all his slides, which I will from his sons. He has two, he was... Uh, he has two sons who have kept all his slides on multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. which is the issue today. And I can get those, I think, for Brilliant. our... Yes, I can do that. And then, and then I can go on. But I, I think the rest is history. But I ended up in the WFN, various committees, public relations committee like you, mm -hmm. and uh, the committee on... Um, on uh, infectious diseases and the committee, because the Commission on Tropical Neurology is the oldest in the WFN. The first commission was Commission on Tropical Neurology. So through that, I continued with the WFN when I was in the UK as well. Um, and eventually in 2005, in the Sydney meeting, 2005, there was an election and there were some issues with the incumbent uh, secretary treasurer general. I will not go through that, but this mm -hmm. is a part of the life of the story of the WFN. And the incumbent was found to be incompetent for mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons. Uh, and uh, then they looked for the person who went with that person in the election and it was me. So I was phoned and I was told that I have been elected mm -hmm. as Secretary Treasurer General. And this was my first election uh, after the Sydney meeting. Mm -hmm. And I was re-elected four years later. And then I put myself uh, for election as president. But that I'm um, summarizing, I don't Hello? know how many decades. <laughs> Long story. Sentences. So the relation of the, with the WFN started in 1981 and continued throughout the Hamburg meeting, the New Delhi meeting, uh, the Vancouver meeting, and then through Buenos Aires and all the world congresses until uh, Sydney. And then after that, I became a trustee, which is how the WFN is run. The WFN is run by trustees, as you know, we are a charity. Yes, yes in the UK. So the trustees uh, uh, and the structure is well, have been well, well thought through and made. And I dare say Lord Walton was the architect of the structure of our federation, which has it, endured decades and will continue, I hope, in its format. And um, I don't think it needs any modernization because the basic skeleton is excellent. So the story goes for many, many decades, and uh, I'm really delighted that the way the WFN is going and the WFN will continue to move on and on. And I'm happy that World Brain Day now is, uh, is an important 
uh, part of the WFN. And of course, it is the day the WFN was first established in 1957. Absolutely. I, I think, think I'll you, stop here and ask you to, if you have any queries or questions. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. I think your fascinating story is, uh, is uh, very much telling how much uh, inclusive uh, World Federation Neurology is. Uh, many of us who serve in committees, uh, uh, the, none of us basically asked to be in these committees. Uh, we were just uh, being interested uh, and committed uh, to the work uh, that we do, and then uh, we would be invited to take part in various committees. And the other story, how Lord Walton uh, helped uh, your family to relocate back to UK is another example, how much uh, international and how much uh, collaborative and how much uh, collegiate uh, World Federation Neurology structure is. Uh, and the other examples that I'm taking from your story is, uh, uh, how much uh, one's uh, passion, uh, perseverance, uh, persistence uh, is uh, paying off uh, just to do what you wanted to do, although it might take some time uh, when uh, you are thrown at uh, various challenges uh, by the life uh, uh, for us. Uh, one question, uh, the, the, the couple of questions out of your fascinating journey uh, the, the you stay during Portugal, so I'm assuming that uh, the you haven't had a salary as such, uh, despite you stayed uh, uh, eight months there and you were trying to learn the language and get back to some sort of academic or clinical work. Uh, uh, the, how did you find uh, uh, courage and enthusiasm to keep working with tropical neurology section? I'm assuming that there was no email or internet. Uh, at that time, I'm assuming that it would have been communication would have been through fax and snail mail posting. Is that That correct? is correct, yes. Oh, oh no, I, I did, we did not have any income during that time. Uh, we did, and, uh, well, how shall I put it? We lived through either family who were abroad sending us $1,000 here, $1,000 to there until we survived. And we lived uh, on friends and colleagues who supported me and supported me and my family. And uh, you are right. This was something which is phenomenal. It was unasked for. Uh, I will not mention names, but one day I'll mention them or write this up. Some of them are alive. Some of them are not. People write me a letter saying, I read John Walton's column and I know where you are now. Uh, and they send me this letter through the WFN office in London and it will be sent to me by post with a stamp uh, the old fashioned way. And I was told, where are you now? Do you have a bank account? Can we help? Mm -hmm. And uh, I had loans from friends, which I repaid when I, started be working in the United Kingdom in 1991 after, after I went back there. So it was during that time I maintained my contacts and by, as you say, by, and the fax was done through, as you know, in the old days, you had these little offices where you go there to send the telegram and the fax mm -hmm. and you receive the fax there because, mm -hmm. or you received the, a letter through a, let, a mailbox mm -hmm. because we don't have a, we moved house three times, no, twice. Uh, and we used to get letters through a mailbox. Mm -hmm. In the city of Cascais, don't know if you know Portugal, it's no, outside, I... it's outside Lisbon. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is how it was. And I continued with my contacts uh, and I had help from family and friends to survive. Because you, you, uh, that time in your life, your uh, priority is for your two children and wife. And uh, But I kept contacts. And I, that's why when I came back to the UK, I met many people. And the one who gave me good advice was the late David Marsden, which I'm sure everyone knows David. Mm -hmm. And when I sat with him and said, here I am, this is what happened to me. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I apply for jobs? Mm -hmm. How can I get a job? Because I've left the UK when I went to Kuwait, so I had no recent references. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and I had to re-establish myself. And uh, luckily to me, I was uh, offered this job. And uh, after that, I was given or invited to apply for a post at Imperial College at Charing Cross. And that was after five years in Middlesbrough. What was uh, David's answer at that time? How did he... Well, his answer you? was that you have your strengths and your strengths are resilience and your strengths are, um, you know, people across the world and his words, not mine. There are very few people of at your stage in life who are so known internationally so that any department which will have you will be very interested in you because of your contacts. And he has no doubt. He said, there's no doubt about your neurological training and your competence in doing a job. That mm -hmm. is not the issue. But you asked me, I asked him, what sort of a position should I go for? Mm -hmm. Should I go for an academic position or an, in the UK, a consultant position, which is mm -hmm. National Health Service in a teaching hospital? Mm -hmm. He said, go for the second because the first one, you will be competing with much younger research fellows who have just done a PhD and their papers are up to date while yours are different. Mm -hmm. So that's why when I applied, um, I was offered the post immediately as a, initially as a locum and six months later as a permanent position. Mm -hmm. And I was to uh, commute between Middlesbrough and Newcastle. How and old you know, you Newcastle, that was for five years. Mm -hmm. And during those five years, I maintained my contact with tropical neurology and with Charlie Poser. And we produced that book. That book was published by Saunders in 96. This was during the time I was in Middlesbrough. I, so my, I knew about, my, I, I knew my about this book. Continued. I knew about this book, but I had no money to buy it. Uh, it's out of print at the moment, unfortunately, isn't it? The first edition. No, Amazon the has it. There are, they have some Amazon. If you're interested, I'll find you a copy and send it to you to sell. Oh, excellent. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I have an extra copy. I'll post it to you. Send me your postal address so I can send it to you. The shall, shall do, shall do. The, the other, other thing that I would uh, like to comment is I, do the, I, I told this to Chandrasekhar Meshram also, who is the secretary for tropical neurology section now. Uh, the, you know that I'm based in Melbourne right now. I'm on call for the weekend. Uh, this is a couple of the, the diagnosis that I made over the weekend. Three patients with uh, tuberculous uh, involvement of brain with a multitude of fascinating lesions in cerebellar hemispheres, uh, other hemispheres of the brain uh, with uh, the variety of clinical manifestations. Uh, another uh, young patient uh, with uh, neurocysticercosis and a truckload of cysts uh, in the brain. I, I think you saw the email asking for your I opinion. Did. And Gertzman syndrome uh, from one of those cysts uh, and then one uh, parasitic cyst, uh, most likely in the third ventricle. And uh, the, so the, the reason that I'm sharing this is uh, the tropical neurology no longer limits to tropics. Uh, tropical neurology has become almost, uh, I wouldn't say bread and butter, but almost a part of your, uh, the, the material in your clinical service, wherever you are, because this world is a one world now. We are so interconnected uh, and there are a whole lot of people all over the world and wherever you are practicing, you are probably going to come across uh, these tropical neurology patients uh, every now and then. Uh, the fortunately or unfortunately for me, there were five of them uh, in this weekend uh, in, in a sort of a very busy, uh, the central business district, uh, Melbourne Hospital. Uh, yes. So some way or the other. My next question to you from this part of the story is, uh, uh, during your second time uh, with uh, Charlie Posner and uh, all those great dons uh, around uh, late Ray Adams, uh, C. Miller Fisher and rest of the others, uh, uh, how the, the, what were the sort of a, uh, fascinating stories or incidents that you could still remember and you would like to share? And how long were you there for at that time? Oh, I was there for 18 months, a year, year and a bit, a year and four months, I think, between the two places. And mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I learned at that time, imagine in the 1980s, Massachusetts General had in the, in the accident and emergency department, in the ER room, 
they had three CT scanners for every stroke because Miller Fisher insisted every stroke should have immediately a CT scan and an angiogram. Mm -hmm. Then. In 1980s. Angiogram. Then. So I learned a lot about how to treat acute stroke and uh, the weekly meetings in what is the most beautiful lecture, old lecture theater. It's called the Ether Dome. The Ether mm. Dome mm. is the first place where ether was used. Mm -hmm. And in the Ether Dome, we had the clinical meetings. And uh, Miller Fisher, uh, everyone who died, or nearly everyone who died at from a neurological disease, his brain was put in a bucket. So the residents were responsible for several buckets of people who they dealt with. Mm -hmm. And you leave them to cook in the bucket, in formalin, and then they will be thin sliced. Mm -hmm. So, and then either Miller Fisher or E.P. Richardson, the famous pathologist, Richardson mm -hmm. Steele syndrome, I'm sure you mm -hmm. know Richardson mm -hmm. Steele syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the most fascinating pathologist was called a lady called Tessa Headley White. Mm -hmm. She comes originally from Durham and qualified in Newcastle, and she was phenomenal pathologist. So we as residents used to go and sit on the Tuesday afternoon and go through the slicing to verify the diagnosis of strokes or brain tumors or tuberculomas or whatever it was that came. And every resident will present his case and see, because this is how Miller Fisher work. Nothing is true unless it is pathologically proven. This was and he one was a great believer in that, in pathological proof. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is how we learned in the, uh, and we, and the, this is how I <laughs> learned from, not just from him, but the whole scene at, uh, at Boston uh, in the middle eighties. So that added to my experience from Scotland and the American experience. So that's why mm -hmm. when I, started going for international work, I knew kind of how the system works on both sides of the pond, mm -hmm. how people thought from these kind of individuals, which I was very fortunate to be able to be associated with. And Poser was continued his interest because he had a huge library in his house, massive papers that Anything you want is all beautifully cataloged. Mm -hmm. That's why him and I edited a journal called, I don't know if you know it, Journal of Tropical and Geographical Neurology. It was published by the Royal Society of Medicine mm -hmm. in, 80, in 92, 93, 94, but could not be sustained because funding. Mm -hmm. Tropical neurology was a poor cousin and a very poor orphan in mm -hmm. the world of neurology. Drug companies were not interested to place adverts because the readership is not really of interest to them. I'm sorry to be so cynical, but this mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. People who live in parts of the world where these conditions are prevalent do not have the funding to purchase expensive new drugs. And mm -hmm. therefore the big pharma was not really into it. And support was not financially. So after two and a half years, the Royal Society of Medicine in England decided that they, and this was not, this could not have been done without Lord Walton's support. Because mm -hmm. remember, he was president of everything, mm -hmm. including the Royal Society of Medicine. Mm -hmm. So he gave us the opportunity to publish mm -hmm. uh, through the RSM. And Charlie and I uh, were the co-editors of that journal. And that's why the term geographical was added exactly because what you said, because it's no longer just the tropics. Mm -hmm. It's the geography and the different mm -hmm. in environmental influences on neurological disease. And as you know, these days with uh, the interest, huge interest that we have in the environment, that would be a very important part of of neurological practice, environmental and geographical factors. Uh, tell us a few of your thoughts about Lord Walton also. He seems to be a very visionary. He seems to be a very visionary man of his time by the look of things. Oh, he's, he's, he's not just visionary. He is 
Walton, John Walton was born in Spennymoor, which is a small town outside southwest of Newcastle. He trained in Newcastle and then uh, as a neurologist and covered neurological practice and then became, well, I can enumerate, I mean, apart from president of the World Federation, president of the General Medical Council, president of the British Medical Association, um, president of the Royal Society of, of Medicine, his knowledge and network is huge. And he knew everything about everybody. So I learned few things from him. For hum human relations, it's not important that I, I just know Tissa. Mm -hmm. And I know Tissa comes from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. But it's important, maybe, for me to know what is Tissa's wife called? Mm -hmm. How many children does Tissa have? Mm -hmm. What is the name of his eldest son or daughter? Mm -hmm. So, and he had this phenomenal memory. So he will meet me in a meeting and say, Rad, how are you? How is Nada? Nada's my wife. Mm -hmm. And he only will give me 30 seconds or one minute or less in a meeting, but he will ask me these questions. And I meet him three years later and he still remembers my wife's name. Mm -hmm. And he still remembers I had two children and how are they and where are they in their education? Mm -hmm. And then we'll move on to speak to the second man who may come from Lithuania or from, um, from Kenya. And he will know that person. And he had this phenomenal memory about people. And he was interested in them as people, not mm -hmm. as just neurologists, but as people who have families, who have interests, who have backgrounds. And that's what makes him unique. And that's why, for instance, when he goes to India, the Indian Academy, the, they, want to, they want me to speak about him in, his, in the next, uh, maybe I will, in September. But the work is huge because he, he then became, he was knighted and then he became a lord and he defended our interests, mm -hmm. especially the interest of disabled individuals in the British government as a lord. Mm -hmm. And he was, I don't know if you know the term, a crossbencher. So he didn't belong to any party in the House of Lords. He wasn't conservative or labor. He was what they called crossbenchers in the middle. So he mm -hmm. dealt with professional issues rather than party political issues. Mm -hmm. And John Walton is one of the most important individuals in the formation of the World Federation mm -hmm. after von Bogart, who was our first president. Mm -hmm. The, and the, his history, as you know, the history of the WFN in Johan Arley's book, mm. there's a section on John Walton, but his mm. memoirs are phenomenally important. And his, uh, I think I have the, uh, the president's column, which you wrote about me in 91. And if you're interested, they have it in the WFN office as well. They have a copy in the archives. I can so send I, it to you to read. I, I, I would love to read. Uh, I, ha the, I have seen uh, one of his video clips uh, the, of uh, him taking a history that someone has recorded uh, yes. from a patient. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. I think uh, the, the, some of uh, these great uh, men uh, the, and women also, but uh, there were more, many men than women. There was no sort of a gender, e the equality, the equality or opportunity at that time anyway, to the, the extent that we have today. Uh, so I hope that the viewers would not uh, find uh, uh, offensive uh, for my comment uh, in, in this particular segment. Uh, and uh, the, the, I think uh, every time when I revisit some of these great uh, men and women, uh, you get absolutely fascinated uh, how uh, how much uh, the interest uh, that they had uh, on other humans uh, and human sort of interaction, which uh, uh, at present uh, potentially at uh, some sort of a crossroad, uh, the, even when we are doing a ward round because we are dealing with EMR, sometimes you tend to forget uh, that there is a human being uh, lying on the bed uh, as mm -hmm. we are uh, talking to a computer interpreting things in the computer, extracting things from the computer, then there's time pressure. I think uh, the, your story about uh, Lord Walton and uh, uh, pointing out uh, that human interaction is, is something that is uniquely important uh, today. 
and uh, the pandemic probably reminded this us uh, very nicely. Now that we can't see people each other, we, no we now know how much uh, useful and how important uh, those interactions are. Do you agree? Absolutely. And the human interactions really is what makes us, this is why I, as what I learned from him, what I learned from my predecessor, Johan Ali. And Johan is another gentleman of the first order. All the people elected as presidents have been honor honorable, uh, cooperative, and I have had interact excellent interaction with all of them. Mm -hmm. But Johan was, as you know, he's Norwegian, he comes from Bergen, uh, and he also is a very, very international, internationally minded person who appreciates that people across the world have to have the opportunity to do wherever they came from. Because on the contrary, people who come from parts of the world where you and I came from, do not have those opportunities that people in the West did in our time, 10, 15 years ago. Maybe they do now with, with Facebook, with Twitter, with, but at that time, they did not have the chance to progress. You, you, and uh, you, to give them the chance when you can, and Johan did. Johan gave the chance to many people to progress through the World Federation of Neurology including me, I learned a lot. I was his secretary general for uh, one term. And that was very, very informative and excellent. And his book on the history of the WFN, the first 50 years is a, a must. Those who are interested in history uh, should read the history of the WFN. And the book is available from, I think it's Oxford University Press. Uh, the, uh, the, I agree. Amazon. I agree, and uh, the, although I did not know him uh, uh, in his book, uh, he managed to put uh, a paragra paragraph or two about me and some of my the initial work uh, on interest in Asia, Oceania region, younger neurologist, uh, when yes. I myself was a trainee. I was surprised that uh, I think uh, I was uh, completely unknown anywhere in the world. I think I had like one paper that I wrote about uh, organophosphate poisoning as a letter to reply in one of the obscure journal. I still joke with my colleagues that I probably would have been the only person who read that uh, letter, although <laughs> editor decided to publish it. Uh, so I had only that paper at that time. And still uh, he had uh, pulse uh, on it and it went to that that book. Uh, so you, 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 you are right. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the I think you, you touched upon the very important uh, topic, uh, why it is uh, important to give opportunity to people in uh, low to middle income countries. A uh, uh, couple of days back, uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Professor Nimar Senanayaka, who is retired now, uh, who is uh, a, 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 the medicine professor in Sri Lanka, but trained in National Hospital Queen Square for like three, four years uh, in 70s. Uh, he, the, the, I was trying to get hold of him for WFN related work for several years, but I haven't had much luck. Uh, so this year I had my luck. Uh, so we spent about an hour talking about it. Uh, I strongly encourage you to watch it when it is available through YouTube channel. I'll let you know the link. Uh, and I, I, uh, the, the, I heard some fascinating stories from him. Uh, he told me that uh, when he came back from Queen Square in mid seventies uh, to Sri Lanka, I became interested in neurology because of him as a young medical student. Uh, he was a tough master. The, the teaching was uh, very different uh, in that era. And uh, the, we couldn't basically question him directly, but his clinical skills uh, and approach to clinical neurology was phenomenal. And during this interview, I heard that uh, he was given an EEG machine by late Professor Harry Mianardi from Netherlands. Uh, and uh, the I was uh, sort of it was uh, mind-boggling the way that he did a very massive epilepsy study from that collaboration and from that uh, network. Uh, I think uh, it's a telling example how giving chance uh, to these tropical countries uh, benefit uh, immense uh, number of patients. Even recently, I interviewed a young neurologist from Thailand, and she told me 
how she managed to create all these auto antibodies with the help of uh, her overseas uh, connections uh, and networks that she established uh, over the years i think it is uh, the 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 wfn has recognized this of course uh, it is not about uh, uh, those people who are in devel- uh, the resourceful countries going there and giving them a talk uh, and coming back it is about uh, giving something more and giving them opportunities to rise up uh, and uh, the then uh, the sort out some of these problems uh, that would have direct translation to better patient care yes um just uh, just one thing about nimal sanayaki and i we go back 30 years more what is fascinating about nimal is his neurological interest but to me what he has done since he left neurology you know he is now uh, a production and manager and uh, uh, a director and sri lankan music sri lankan theater and i went to one or two of his plays in kandy and he uh, and when i was in colombo him and i he told me exactly what he is doing and he showed me videos so here is a man like ian simpson who was eminent in his field sinaraki was eminent in his field but he had other interest and the yes. other interest is he's becoming eminent in that interest as well and maybe when i saw him after that i stopped talking to him about neurology i start asking him about his theatrical mm. production and the company and the music he's making which is phenomenal so just, neurologists are very talented people not just in neurology but across the board in all aspects of life absolutely i think you were spot on he i think he he won the highest award that a sri lankan artist can win for his mm. uh, artwork not once not twice but multiple times uh, mm. and it is it is all over the shop from songs uh, music uh, lyrics uh, drama films uh, and uh, the the it's uh, the, the, uh, you 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 were uh, you were uh, you you are spot on i, I totally agree yes. and uh, yes. the, 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 i think i think that's a timely reminder that uh, why we sh- we all should have some side in- side interests uh, also isn't it uh, you want to comment on that now well i i do have many interests uh, and uh, can't think of anything specific that that i would like to say apart from the fact that we are uh, now i'm living in england there are many opportunities for getting interested in my culture arabic culture reading arabic book trying to renew my ability to write in arabic which is not an easy language mm-hmm. poetry in arabic is a very difficult thing to do but reading historical aspects of our culture and its relationship to the west and how when i say the west i mean the west generally and i give lectures there is a society here in west of london called the windsor medical society mm-hmm. nothing to do with the queen or windsor it's just the area of windsor and in that society they allow medics like me or anyone else to come and give lectures but they can speak about anything except medicine so when you go there you have to give a very well prepared lecture on a topic nothing to do with medicine mm-hmm. it can be anything you like so that got me interested and from the time I was in newcastle about a woman called gertrude bell mm-hmm. i don't know you don't think you've heard of her gertrude bell was a phenomenal woman one of the first or if not the first graduate from oxford in english and history uh, in the late 1900s and she became a writer traveler and she traveled to northern arabia including what is now saudi arabia which wasn't saudi arabia then in 1906 1912 was it the force the word saudi was added to arabia mm-hmm. and she traveled and wrote about the tribes of that part of the world imagine a woman with two companions local companions three camels traveling and writing daily daily um diary of her travels she was eventually recruited by the british intelligence naval intelligence in alexandria 
to give them a background that was before the First World War, uh, to give them who are these people, the tribes who rule Arabia where oil was starting to come out. Mm -hmm. So she knew everybody and wrote daily to her stepmother and father back in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very rich people. Her father, John Bell, was an MP. Mm -hmm. I got interested in her because she, when she died, after establishing the Iraq Museum, she was a, uh, she did all the excavations in the city of Ur, U R of Sumeria, mm -hmm. in Babylon, mm -hmm. in Nineveh, mm -hmm. and the artifacts that were found are now found in the British Museum, the Berlin Museum, Chicago Museum. University of Pennsylvania Museum. So she was a very, very erudite, educated woman. And uh, she worked at the same time as Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia, mm -hmm. who was in many ways, she was his boss, if you like, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she didn't, her books uh, are many, mm -hmm. and her books, before she became an official spy, that's the right word for her. She took photographs. There are 7,500 old fashioned glass slides mm -hmm. of all of that area from Damascus to Jerusalem, Northern Saudi Arabia, and the whole of Iraq mm -hmm. in the University of Newcastle. Mm -hmm. So when I was in the North, in addition to tropical neurology, I got access to the Newcastle library I wrote a letter and got the special access. You can't get in unless you wear white gloves. And you... mm. So I went and, uh, and then that's one of the lectures or I gave that lecture or varieties of that lecture on a remarkable person who happens to be a woman in the late 19th century, early 20th century to the Windsor Medical Society. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to many other societies, varieties of how women have shaped our knowledge of the Middle East, where people always thought it's a man's world. Mm. It may mm. have been, mm. but she, she had a, I told John Walton this, she had what Walton had in a very limited way. Mm -hmm. She knew everybody who is married to this sheikh of this tribe is, has three wives and his wives are the daughters of, as you know, alliances are made by marriage in tribal, mm. in tribal mm. world. How many children do they have? how many of their sons became sheikh, how many didn't, how many assassinated, how many became spies for the other tribe. She mm. knew everything about that mm. and wrote it. So she was the most valuable person when the British, and it was really an army from the East India Company that entered Basra mm -hmm. in the south of Iraq under British command. Mm -hmm. They first entered and they had, they suffered the biggest loss in the history of the British army when 12,000 British soldiers were captured by the Ottomans in Kutalamara in 1915. And then they came back again in 1917. And then the second time, the, the support for the Ottomans from the Germans became much less and the war and Iraq was occupied and became under British mandate and she was the first secretary to the viceroy who, because they, Iraq was under the viceroy of India. All that mm -hmm. part of the world was ruled from India mm -hmm. by the viceroy. But then it became a colony. And who was the colonial secretary? Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. So she worked with Winston Churchill. And after his defeat, well, the British army's defeat in the Dardanelles, I don't know, it's another, another big defeat for the British army in the First World War at the hands of the Ottomans, where Churchill was minister uh, and he was responsible for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And most, who are the most, most nationality of dead in the Dardanelles and the Gallipoli? Anzan, Australians. Yes, yes, true. So, this part of history and her role in that history is something which, uh, which I read a lot about and I know a lot about 
And I dare say in many ways, I know as much if not more about that part and that part of history as much I know about neurology. So, so uh, I go around giving those lectures and if the WFN wants me to give that lecture, I don't know how many of them will be interested in history of a remarkable woman. And that woman is Gertrude Lauvian Bell. Right, right. She died in 1926 at the age of 56. And she was a chain smoker, by the way. The cigarette never left her hand, one cigarette to the other. Right, right, right. So she was a fascinating woman. So my interests go beyond neurology, and I hope they continue to go beyond neurology. But my love is for neurology, and the WFN has been the most important part. And the of reason is I met so many people. I met so many dear, nice people from Latin America. I am still on their board of the Pan American Federation of Neurological Societies. I met people from the Indian subcontinent, my friends in the Indian Academy of Neurology in Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, everywhere really. And I continue, and I would like to continue to be part of their kind of atmosphere. And if there's anything I am asked to advise upon, I'll be more than happy to oblige at any time. You, you would agree that all these countries uh, the, have shown how resilient uh, we are as a community, having seen how our Indian colleagues, uh, how uh, our African colleagues, uh, how our American colleagues, how our European colleagues, uh, how our Oceanian colleagues uh, carrying on with academic activities, uh, the, the, the infectious uh, Inf neurological infection series, uh, the inspiring people series, uh, some of the other virtual educational activities uh, is telling, isn't it, uh, during last uh, 16, 17 months, uh, which had been rather unprecedented challenging times for many of us. You are absolutely correct. And uh, I only have to say that uh, the tropical neurology uh, research group, tropical and geographical neurology research group activities have been phenomenal. Our f every first Saturday of the month activities used to be every Saturday of the month. And although these um, Skype meetings, they cost money to, to perform. And the money and the money that we have been getting at the tropical neurology research group has been coming from the Indian Academy of Neurology. Mm -hmm. So they have been supporting us uh, in our activities, which are now every first Saturday of the month with inspiring people in neurology. And the last one we had was, uh, I think it was Ray Adams, before him it was Miller Fisher, before him uh, it was, uh, uh, it was John Newsom Davis from Oxford, and we are continuing over the course of the next six months. So our support comes from uh, the academies and the associations that have worked very hard in spite of the difficulties we face with the pandemic, but we carry on. That comes to the next uh, the point uh, that uh, you, uh, you have been part of uh, World Brain Day activities uh, on formative days. Uh, we are now into the eighth year. Uh, how excited are you to see that WFN partnered with another massive uh, organization called Multiple Sclerosis International Federation and all the other uh, Global Neurology Alliance groups uh, to run an ambitious agenda advocating for multiple sclerosis. As you know, we now have uh, close to 3 million patients with multiple, multiple sclerosis globally and access to medications and access to early diagnosis uh, is uh, available to less than 30% of the countries uh, as we speak. Uh, so advocacy and awareness uh, is badly needed. Uh, I am of the opinion that uh, we should run this ambitious agenda to reach over 100 million people, initially targeting at uh, 3 million or close to 3 million social media posts, uh, asking people to uh, type uh, hashtag World Brain Day, type hashtag uh, Stop Multiple Sclerosis, whatever the social media channel that they use, whether it is Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, 
whatever. So if we get 3 million, it is very easy to surpass a lot, actually 100 million, even 150 million. Uh, how excited are you to see such ambitious agendas uh, and the, the, the uh, relentless activities uh, from our committee uh, and our friends uh, globally? I think what you're doing is, to me, is phenomenal. And it is made easier, I think, made easier by the, the world we live in now, by social media. When we started this eight, eight, 10 years ago, there wasn't the social media exposure that we had. And I am most delighted that we have done issues and we have combined with stroke, with headache, with epilepsy, and now we are moving to multiple sclerosis and the advocacy for patients with multiple sclerosis and disability in general. And we have to emphasize that. And uh, in the WHO Atlas, which we produced with the WHO second edition, access is diagnostics are very important. And if we can advocate and we have, but these, but these are governmental. They have to be investment from governments, investment from governments in pro the production of diagnostic tools, because these diagnostic tools are expensive. They're uh, not only to purchase them, but to keep running them is expensive. And this is why uh, we, it's difficult to, I'm not saying that, there is multiple sclerosis in resource rich countries and multiple sclerosis in research poor countries. The care they get, the care they obtain is different and you cannot deny that the care is different. And to have the support, if I was someone with multiple sclerosis in the research poor country, but have access to what you're doing, I will be very heartened by your support and my group, and then form a small group to advocate for us and go to government. So how are you going to go from your campaign to the Neurological Association of Country X and resource, and resource poor settings, and how we can they use the advocacy and the resources that you have to go to their minister of health and say, listen, if we don't do this, X people in our country, say a small country like uh, Nepal, a small country like, uh, you know, Ghana, as, uh, how would that help that society to convince their ministers of health? And what you mentioned is correct. Did there, we tried. And the only way that these ministries of health can be influenced is through WHO. Uh, WHO has a, not only a regional office, but a country office. In every country in the world, there is somebody employed by the WHO. His job is to promote health generally. And you can imagine the pressures on them from... Uh, vaccination of children, to protection of pregnant women, to the environment, et cetera, et cetera. How do you get to them and say, in your country, if you do this, and you have to give them one, two, three, four, and remember, most of the time, they are either family physicians or epidemiologists or maybe non-medical. Go to the Ministry of Health and say, this will cost you so much, but it will save so many lives and it will save you so much money in looking after disabled individuals with this condition. How do you translate this to that is what I find our main obstacle that we face. And indeed, that was the key, the key reason that we wanted to bring this World Brain Day campaign in the first place, that's the ambitious agenda. So the point is in 1948, World Health Organization defined health as uh, complete uh, so the physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely not having disability or infirmity. That's how they define as uh, health, uh, which is true today. But one thing they didn't address at that time is, uh, as uh, Vladimir Hachinsky recently pointed out on a very short uh, correspondence to Lancet Neurology, I believe it is in May, I'll send you the 
PDF. No, I have. I've seen it. I've seen it. You have seen it. Uh, I think. I think he got it right. Uh, the you can't have health uh, having properly functioning or optimized uh, brain function for someone to have uh, complete uh, well-being of uh, uh, physical, social, and mental. Uh, the the one of the overarching and driving force uh, is uh, preserved uh, brain function as best as uh, we can so it is up to us to convince uh, our policy makers and politicians uh, i believe even the most corrupted prime minister or president uh, in any country they still want their constituents to have uh, reasonably functioning brain health it just uh, we just need to remind them that uh, there is no health without brain health uh, So, so that's that's that correct so our idea is uh, we pick a disease uh, or interest uh, per year and then we create a material that we posted on our toolbox uh, that people can download including press releases and then we want those craft groups and groups as you mentioned to use them as they belong to them and then advocate uh, to get their policy makers and ministers and prime ministers interested in it for the first time in the world brain day campaign i email a couple of prime ministers and health ministers uh, to try our luck to see whether they are happy to release a 30 second uh, short video clip uh, virtually saying just simple thing i support world brain day i support uh, uh, the stroke multiple sclerosis campaign so we want them to think uh, in terms of brain health the problem one of the problem that we face at the moment is uh, we try to advocate these things uh, in silos uh, uh, include this is not a criticism but even in who the mental health appear to come from different angle rather than from brain we seems to have forgotten that uh, mental health actually come from brain it doesn't come from your knee joint or hip joint it's a, it's it's a manifestation of brain i hope eventually the world brain day campaign would put all of us together this is not one group against each other this is about uh, putting everything together just like uh, world federation of neurology has grown supporting all neurological disorders eventually we would convince uh, fellow human beings that brain is important uh, and it is universal brain health uh, and eventually we just like we share vaccines and we try to address this global crisis with covid-19 as a global issue not as a national issue uh, that's what the g7 summit has agreed uh, when they met uh, at chatham recently i hope eventually we would convince our political leaders at least in rich countries to come to the party that promoting brain health uh, in humans uh, is at the core interest uh, of survival and maintenance of uh, human species that's a very ambitious agenda so we'll wait and see whether we can thank get you. there eventually yes thank you just one maybe one final comment from me on the who i've seen three generations or three presidents of our section mental health and with the three of them the first two uh, they were all psychiatrists by trade and this recent one is a psychologist but over the years having worked on icd11 where maybe i didn't mention that mm. i chaired the topic advisory group of nervous diseases in the new classification of disease icd11 since 2009 to try to change the who name of the department into the division of brain health under which there is mental health and neurological health is most difficult if not impossible we found so far but what the what they have come down now is they found a small unit called brain health unit and the doctor who's running this who is a pediatric neurologist from india tarun dua and by the way she was initially appointed and her salary was supported by the wfn mm-hmm. she was supported by Uh, Johan Ali when he was vice president representing the WFN in the WHO mm-hmm. so this is how we started and we built very slowly and it takes a long time and when i said there is no health without brain health and this was with the british secretary of state for health 
uh, on uh, the during the session on dementia mm -hmm. and the declaration of London on dementia in 2013. You are right, we have to influence government and maybe one of the brain days should be, the title should be general, no health without brain health. Mm, mm, mm. Rather than epilepsy, stroke, dementia, mm. which is all appropriate, multiple sclerosis, all appropriate, but the generic rule, and the only way to get through is the NCD platform. Mm -hmm. Mm. non-communicable diseases. As you know, when it started initially, there was no neurology in it. There was no neurological disability in it. And it took about four years for them to add the word with neurological diseases, just the word neurological diseases to be added. And this was during the time of Professor Alwan, who was the previous, previous director of our section in the WHO. So we need to work and continue to work and show the world and what you're doing is the right thing. And the disability aspect of it is what makes ministers of health understand. I, I agree. I think in, in not, I agree. I think uh, the, your point on non-communicable diseases is a valid one. The, the, the psycho neuroimmunological approaches in, in specifically what we learned during last 14, 16, 15 months uh, out of COVID-19 pandemic uh, as a frontline clinician, I have witnessed uh, how brain is significantly involved uh, in these uh, infections and how the behavior of brain, how the, uh, the, the stress pathways and immunological pathways and are driving long-term impact uh, of these patients. Uh, we wrote uh, a series of manuscripts on this uh, and the story is not finished yet. Uh, I think uh, we just need to test uh, how we can intervene some of these psychoneuroimmunological approaches. When I say psycho, it's actually coming from brain. And therefore, uh, I think uh, the improving brain health and understanding uh, how brain is working with the rest of the other organs and interconnected with some of the other disorders that are costing a hell of a lot of money for countries' health systems uh, would probably give them dividends very quickly if they give due recognition for brain and uh, they put uh, brain health, uh, the, the, as uh, Professor Hachinsky suggests, uh, as part of the new definition of health, uh, that uh, the, for you to have uh, all those uh, 1948 definition, really good stuff, uh, you need to incorporate uh, redefine brain health uh, and optimize uh, brain function and support uh, further preservation and development. Uh, I think uh, we probably need to improve this a little bit more as we continue to debate. Uh, we talk a lot uh, since uh, the, I think you just uh, woke up a little bit uh, uh, earlier. And mm -hmm. uh, the, before we finish off this interview, uh, uh, the, Rad, uh, given that you have such a wide uh, experience and wisdom and uh, the, 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 the exposure to all kinds of all parts of the world, my last question to you is, uh, what is your take home message to those youngsters out there? When I say youngsters, uh, think of them uh, from high school days, uh, university days, uh, medical students, uh, any other healthcare student, uh, uh, young neurologists, uh, uh, young nurses, uh, young allied health folks, uh, men, women, all right across the board, but keeping what we talk about brain health uh, and neuroscience uh, stuff on one side. On the other side, uh, youngsters, uh, uh, what is your take home message to them? Well, this is crucial that young people are now much more logical, less emotional than in my day in the 60s. They look at things and they see a lot of unfairness in the world. And the unfairness is to people who have neurological and brain health issues, whatever there are, and they see that they can help these people by knowing more and more about brain function. And brain function is very logical and clear specialty. I'm not saying cardiology isn't or liver diseases aren't or lung diseases are not, but the brain is so intricate. There is no other organ in the universe that is as sophisticated as the brain. 
And for a youngster to understand this sophistication, understand how to influence it or learn from it and understand how to unravel its secrets is something which will fascinate any young intelligent person in any of the specialties that we you, you mentioned, whether it's neurology, whether it's neurosurgery. By the way, I didn't mention to you, I started as a neurosurgeon and I could not, I did not have the dexterity to carry on after about six months, I moved to neurology and lucky to me, I did. But to know how the brain circuitry works, how the synapses work, what influences what in the brain is all very logical so far and will need a lot of unraveling to continue to do. So young people will look at this and think, well, this is a specialty which makes sense. And neurology is a specialty that makes sense. It needs a lot of understanding, but once you start understanding a bit of it, like we do, then it makes sense and you increase your knowledge and your horizon by knowing more about the most sophisticated organ, in my opinion, in the universe, which is the human brain. Thank you so much, uh, the Professor Ad Shakir and uh, the, our warmest and best wishes for you, your wife, uh, Nada, and your two children and uh, the grandchildren and rest of the others. So we wish all of them well and stay safe and stay well. We continue to see your support and wisdom and advice uh, on World Federation Neurology Matters in time to come. I agree with you that uh, it is uh, heading on the right direction and it is uh, very supportive promoting brain health uh, and activities are growing from strength to strength. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you face to face uh, one of these days. Uh, hopefully once we come out of uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, which I believe is going to be a much better world as we are more wiser now than before. And we are even more collaborative and we found new ways to connect with each other when we can't travel. All the very best. Take care. Thank you and stay safe and well. Thank you very much. And just want to congratulate everybody today in the United Kingdom is Father's Day. Oh. So I'll be seeing my children uh, in about two hours from now. So happy Father's Day to all fathers. Thank you. Excellent. Happy Father's Day to you and all other fathers too. The, take care Thank and you. stay well and safe. Uh,